Does this place look familiar? Yeah. Probably the only person that sells software that puts pictures of his own jobs or her own jobs on the actual front. Someone, uh, it was a Brando and Johnston actually asked me to come and give a demonstration of PT data. They were thinking about buying it. They did buy it. But they put me on the spot like I've never been put on the spot. They liked this picture and they made me sit there in front of the whole company and actually recreate the PT data uh, run for this external post tensioning. <laughs> and I did it. I don't think I made any mistakes, at least none that they noticed. That's a trick. <laughs> Okay, so before we go, before I continue on my project problem, uh, let's set up yours. Let's get you going. Some of you are uh, jumping on this just like I hoped you would. I've already gotten distribution factors from a number of people. Everybody's gotten them right so far, which isn't surprising. The people who jump on it first usually tend to get those right. So I'll ask again, not mandatory, but has anybody downloaded the program and at least attempted to install it? All right, good. I probably should have told you to bring your laptop because we're going to do your, we're going to input it right now and create the file. I will show you. Hopefully you have, if you don't have your laptop, that's fine, but hopefully you have the project. That's going to be important that you're following along and you see how I come up with what I'm doing. Okay, it opens up to this screen, Coronado. You're thinking crab as soon as you see this. You'll have an association with that the rest of your life. Click on New Beam Girder. You can put in the project name. This is your project. This is your name. This is your year. <clears throat> you have a two span beam. Uh, I didn't draw this up on the board, but I, I've got a plan view just like, just like I did for my project. Yours looks very similar. You have different spans. You have different loading. You have a little bit different beam section. You have the same column section. You'll see why that's a great column section in a minute. My example is all parking. I just have the same load in both, both bays, both spans. Yours. The left long span between A and B is parking loading. I've shown you on the second page what parking loading is. Parking loading is the weight of the concrete, which the program will calculate itself. For your hand calculations, you need to calculate the weight of the concrete. There is an additional three pounds a square foot that I want you to use. My example is using two. I want to make sure you're not just blindly following my example. So I'm changing things in here. You've got three pounds a square foot of additional dead load. That could be for anything. That could be for uh, plumbing, uh, fire sprinklers, conduit. I don't know that you're going to be able to see anything from there. Um, okay. The other span, the shorter span, it's a, it's a shorter span. You're going to probably expect that that would be the controlling span. But I've pumped up the load. I've given you office loading. It's not unusual. In fact, in one of my very first projects, I had two span beams. One side was, was parking. The other side was partitioned actually for a fitness center. But could be office space. Could be a different type of occupancy. So you've got office loading between spans B and C. Office loading is 35 pounds a square foot additional dead load. And we're going to use 80 pounds a square foot of live load. OK, so you come to this screen. Most of the things will default already. You just leave them alone. Uh, this is the student version. You're set up. It, it knows that your stress limitation is 7.5 square root F prime C. I have given you 5,000 PSI concrete, and the program defaults to that for the beams and the columns. The one thing. You might as well change. It wouldn't really matter a lot, but change. I've asked you to use number eight bars, both top and bottom. Stirrup size is number three. It's already set for you. All the covers, just leave those alone. Those are um, 
those are correct for you. Those will result in a four inch distance maximum or uh, from the face of concrete to the center of gravity of the steel. So you're good. Really you, what you need to do is put in UCLA CE143 project uh, two span beam. And you change the spans to two. There are no cantilevers, so you don't check anything. One thing that's important is the student version defaults to a uniform distribution of live load. If you clicked this button, the program would analyze the live load in one span only, then in the other span, then on both spans, and figure out the worst possible moments and related stresses uh, and demand moments. That's, that's a lot more work than is necessary to teach pre-stressed concrete, so I'm not requiring that you do that. So you will be it'll default to a uniform live load arrangement. So we're good. You're prompted for the most typical column. The bottom column length on your project is how much? Close. 16 feet. The C1 and the C2 two dimensions column, the C1, anytime you're in concrete and anybody asks you about the one dimension, L1, C1, anything one, one is in the direction of analysis, two is perpendicular to the direction of analysis. So it doesn't matter if you're doing post tension concrete or not. The C2 dimension is the perpendicular dimension of the column to the, uh, to the analysis. That's 24. It's also the same as the C1 dimension, which makes life easy for you. This is the far end fixity. The far end, if you see how I drew these columns, I drew them as fixed. That is what the code says you can do and should do in an, what's called an equivalent frame analysis. So an F goes there. The top column is how, how long? 12 feet. Okay, we're all set. First thing to do in this screen, span one is 67 feet for you. Span two is 49 feet. I strongly suggest you just be simple and call both of these sections have, the beam in both spans has the same section, cross section. Just call it A. Name it A. If you really want to name it P or M, that's fine too, but I picked A. We're defining the cross-section geometry. The cross-section geometry is going to be type 1. We just have straight beam faces. So put a 1. It will prompt you for a cross-section that looks like cross-section 1. What is the tributary area in this project? 19 feet. Somebody other than Eric, what's the height of the beam? 36. Thickness of the slab? 5 inches. Width of the web? Okay, at this point, you can calculate. 16 times the flange thickness uh, plus the beam web width, or you can just hit enter and it will do it for you. Programs should do all the calculations for you. They should do every calculation that they can. The only things you should be inputting are things that the program couldn't know without your help. Okay, so this screen, this window is now set, the spans and the cross section type. We go to the loading. Uh, I would like you just to click on uniform load. First, it's going to ask you, be careful, the superimposed load. It will calculate all the weight of the concrete. It now has all the information it needs to calculate the concrete weight. You told it what the tributary width is. You told it what the slab thickness and the beam properties are. It will calculate that. What it doesn't know is that you want three pounds a square foot in addition. Remember, this is kips per square foot. so it's. 
and I'm in the first span. Live load in the second span, or the first span, sorry, yeah. is 40. Standard parking loading. The program will default to assuming that you want to put that on the entire length of the building. That's what zero is the starting point of that uniform load. Uh, uh, a is the starting point of that uniform load, and B is the ending point. You could put it on a partial, uh, you can keep adding loads and put a distribution on the middle 15 feet if you want, or the left 20. I mean, it, it allows you to do anything, but it's going to default to assuming that you want that the full length, and you do. So we're just going to leave A at zero and B at 67. Now, be careful. When, when you have done this screen and you clicked uniform load, that put that on all spans. So your second span is actually different. So just go to the next span. You see that it just added the 3 pounds a square foot and the 40 pounds a square foot live load. It just, um, it's assuming, because most of the time it's true, that you have that in all spans. In your project, though, you're going to overwrite the 3 pounds a square foot in the office area and put 35 pounds a square foot. The live load is 80 pounds a square foot. Okay, so now I go back to the previous span. I've got the three additional dead load. Go ahead and take pictures if you want. This, that's very helpful for you. Each screen should end up looking like this as you're going through it. Span two, 35 pounds a square foot, 80 pounds a square foot of live load. So we've established all the superimposed loading. Say we're OK. Ask me what profile, what tendon profile do I want? We're using one. So put in one there. It'll assume you also want one in that. Just keep hitting OK. So we're set up. It will analyze the system based upon equivalent loads and, and a profile based on type 1. Everything's OK. We've input everything the program needs to start. It's going to give us one more chance to go back and change anything. We don't want to. We're going to say it's OK. This is the one problem. This is. When I rewrote this, I rewrote it because we all have these big 36-inch wide screens on our desks. And in fact, I have two of them. And I can't even go home and do work with one monitor. It just feels like I've got one hand tied behind my back. But um, a laptop doesn't quite fit, at least on mine. Or if I was smarter, I would be able to manipulate the projection uh, settings. But I haven't figured out how to do that yet. But up here, what you're looking at is the force and profile. It takes a first stab at it for you. It, this program, and I, I will give credit to the competitors too, ADAPT will also keep you out of trouble for the most part. As long as you didn't give it an impossible task or something that has no good answer, it will come up with a force and profile for you that is code compliant. It may not be a great design, but it's code compliant. This is what the program would like to see. It would like to see uh, 10 tendons in the left side and then drop off some and fully drape both ends. That would be the most efficient. That was actually the third thing I had you do in homework number three was, I think you reduced one bay to, from 12 to 8 tendons. And you fully draped those, and that came up with a great solution. Well, the program would like you to start with that. But we're not going to do that. That complicates the analysis issues. And, uh, and it assumes that I can stress from this side. The only way I could get, I could drop off tendons where they're shown dropped off. You see that? They're, they're shown being dropped off right here is if I could stress out this side. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're not, you're constrained by 
You could be nine inches from another building. You could be subterranean on this side. You could have a whole two levels of soil built up and making it very difficult to stress this way. So you could only stress this way. Now, if you could only stress this way, you can't drop tendons off in the far bay. You have to bring everything through. So I guess the assumption we're making is that we can't, we can't stress from that side. That rebar is done. By the way, we just finished the design. The program just finished it. It just did everything. In that screen, it had designed the shear steel for you. It checked VCN, VCI, VCW, found the, the best one for your case, uh, calculated the, the minimum required stirrup spacing, put in the stirrup spacing where it needed it, calculated the longitudinal steel for strength, checked it against all minimums, and you were done. Now. That's why people pay $3,500 for this program, is because they're finished. They're, they can do 20 of these before lunch and go. You can also have no idea what you're doing and use this program and do fine. <laughs> um, that, that, you know, I had to be careful what I say, but I think that's probably most of the people out there doing pre-stressed concrete design may have trouble actually doing the project that you're doing. Okay, I want, I've given you parameters though, and some of you have actually already calculated those. The program's telling me what the balance load is here, how much of the concrete weight as a percentage I'm balancing. I have told you I want you to balance between 65 and 70 uh, percent of the concrete weight. Right now, this is a code compliant design. Balance loads are not part of the code. You can, these are really good uh, recommendations that post-tensioners who've been doing this for decades follow to get good designs, but it's not code. These are just office standards. So 56.3 at fully draped is no good. Let me add a couple of tendons. That gets me in that bay up to between the 65 and the 70 that I want. So I'm looking at using 12 tendons. And like I said, because I can't drop them off, that's the assumption, I've got to use 12 tendons in both bays. So your design, we are going to use 12 tendons. Everybody, all 58 people doing this project, 12 tendons, nothing different. But look what's happening. I even get a warning that I'm fully draped in this bay, and I've overbalanced. I, I'm 26.2 more than 100% balanced. So if you could see the full screen, you see that you get a warning down here that you've got high balance loads. So what does that mean? That means I don't want to fully drape that bay. Remember what you did in homework number three, that you don't want to be grossly overbalancing the shorter bay. I've already done this problem. If I use 21 inches, I'm right under 70% balanced. Both bays now are in that 65 to 70% balance. So take a picture of this screen. This is what I want. This is what everybody in this class is going to do in this project. 12 tendons, 12 strands in each bay. Um, One other thing that you're going to have to uh, overwrite. The program, like I told you before, is going to go to the nearest quarter inch for the CGS values at the very end of the beam. I want you to put in the exact values, the exact value to the center of gravity. And that, that is going to be 11.65 inches from the top. Very minor difference, but since we're you're not going to believe me when I say this, but your answers by hand are going to be within 1%, typically less, of what the computer gets. 
That sounds somewhat shocking, but when I see a number that's more than 1%, that's how I'm checking your answers, I'll go back and see if you have an actual calculation mistake somewhere. Because I've done this for enough, enough times myself and enough years in this project, and if you're just keeping enough significant figures, I don't mean seven past the decimal point, but as long as you're keeping significant figures and not rounding too much, you are going to be within 1% or less of basically every value that this program calculates. And I, I'm going to show you that, and you're going to show yourself that. Now, what's interesting is the beam's really governed by tensile stresses. You're, I'm having you calculate the compressive stresses. I've told you, you know, we've been calculating tension and compressive stresses. I've also told you that if you ever have a beam design that is governed by your compressive stresses, something's gone very wrong. So over here on the right are just the tensile stresses. It's looking at the tension locations where it expects tension, and it calculates that. I have no flags down here at the bottom, which means, and I know I'm less than 530 in all those locations, I already know that this design works. I know that this design satisfies stresses. You are going to calculate all that and prove that to yourself, but the program's done. You get to this, you, you get this so that you have no flags, you are really finished. What you will do at this point is save the file, print this out, mark it up a little bit for a draftsman. It's close, but it's not good to go for a draftsman. That's why I'm asking you, part of your project, at the very end, I want a full and complete, as, to scale as reasonable as you can do of this. Some people want to just turn this back into me. This is close. This tells me what the force is. I want you to tell me how many tendons there are. So you're going to do this drawing telling me both the force and the tendons, 12 tendons. This tells me the exact area of steel that I need. It doesn't tell me how many number eight bars that is. I want you to tell me how many number eight bars you're using. A draftsman, you would never write, I need 1.56 square inches of steel, and hand that over to a draftsman. Maybe a good draftsman could convert that for you to rebar, but your job is to mark it up, hand it to the draftsman, it goes on the drawings, the draftsman wants to know how many tendons, what the effective force is, and how many number something bars are in each one of these locations. So that's what your final markup is. It's a little bit better than this. This has already calculated what the shear steel needs to be, but be careful. The program is using VCN, VCI, and VCW. I have told you, you only are required to use the VCN equation, so your stirrup spacing should be a little tighter than, than what you're seeing on your output. So your shear output from PT data is not the same as you're going to turn in on your drawing to me. Is everyone clear on that? I'm not requiring that you do the intensity that you're going to do in, in homework number six for this project. I'm, all, I'm giving you one of the easier equations to use, if not the easiest. But that means that you're not going to have the VC capacity that you might have otherwise. The program's calculating, taking advantage of everything. So, Now you have the option at this point of going to the review menu, but the program has finished designing everything for you. It, it, it took that long, and that was me going very slow. I know how to use the program pretty well. I could have done that entire pro problem and input it and gotten the answer in about three minutes, and I'd be done with that two-span beam design. It's as long as it takes me to print it out, mark it up, or since I don't use a draftsman and don't mark things up for draftsman, I have my other screen. I've got PT data on one. I've got AutoCAD on the other. I'm doing the calculations here, putting it on the drawings there. And that's how Brian and I work in our office. But it's done. It gives you, you have the ability to go back and look at all kinds of stuff, but this is just academic. Most of the world who uses this program will never look in any of these windows. It doesn't matter to them. It just the design was done, it printed it out on that elevation, they take their word for it that it's right, 
and go with it. Um, anyway, as we go through my, my example, I will keep pulling up PT data and show you where you find the hand answers in the program. I've also given you hard copy output of all that. Yeah? So back to the drawing, you have to call out the effective stressing force and not the total stressing force as they crank it to in the field? Uh, you're going to put on that exact force. That, that force, every one of you is going to, except for one, because I always get one who decides to do <laughs> their own problem, <laughs> even though I've said, please don't. Every one of you is going to tell me that that's 319.46 or 319.5. That's the answer. You can start drawing it today if you want. Um, you already know the force and profile, so the first part of doing your, your your drawing is done. We've established what the force and profile is. You've gotten a peak preview to know what the stresses are. Those are the stresses you're going to calculate and within about one PSI you guys will all calculate those same stresses, believe it or not. Um, that, once you've proven that to yourself, that will lock in that force and profile. The program's already, already telling you that it's going to work. Okay. Any questions on PT data? It takes about three or four minutes to do a beam design. It's going to take you a couple of good weeks, you know, not working full time on it. You're going to do about 35 pages of calculations to, to do what it just did without you almost looking. <laughs> the um, interesting thing is you will be in a very small select group of people after you've done this there's this 30 to 40 pages of calculations that most people can't do, haven't done, never will do, and don't know what's happening. So leads me to my next point. <clears throat> I, please take this seriously, not for me, but for you. I'm telling you after five years, I still get emails back. I still get people telling me that they're referring back to the project, that they've given uh, company lectures at lunch on the project to their own firms because their firms don't have people in it that are technically proficient in pre-stressed concrete. So the people who are coming out of UCLA and now out of Cal Poly are the ones who are teaching the companies the technical parts of pre-stressed concrete design. So. I just blindly accept it and, and go on. I've got lunch I'm looking forward to, and I want to get home to Little League Baseball. <laughs> Not really, but I'll be honest with you. I've, I have run through an exam. You know, I do this every single year standing here. I've done this enough. I trust that program. It's scary to ever say that you trust implicitly any program, but at some point when you've hand calculated just about everything it ever does and you always get the same answer, you will get a comfort level. I can't use other programs that, I, that are black boxes. It, it terrifies me. Um, without going into a big lecture, you know, I came from a time when computers were new. <laughs> Not er we didn't, when I went to work at Engelkirk's office in 1989, nobody had a computer on their desk. We had a computer room. And in that computer room were two Windows-based computers and one Macintosh computer. And we would all, we had 45 of us in the office, and you had to decide, was it faster to do it by hand or use the steel manual or get up and stand in line and wait for George to be done? George was always in there. He just loved doing ETABS models and taking up that forever. And you'd wait and you'd wait. And then a computer would open up, and you'd go in and you'd do your problem. And you'd You'd print it out and take it back to your desk and finish your design. But you had to weigh whether or not it, it made more sense and, and took less time to go do that than to just do it by hand. So a lot of the stuff that we did was by hand. Um, I had an HP 41C calculator, which was one of the very first programmable calculators. We could program uh, composite beams in there and calculating area of steel if you, for concrete. 
it's terrific. Well, we were high tech. But I'd sit at my desk using my HP 41C and then think about whether or not I wanted to go in and use Frame Mac on the Macintosh or, or something else. But that, that's the truth. Um, it was, I worked seven years at Engel Kirks and only in the last uh, maybe three did I actually have a computer on my desk. But my point is, software was in its infancy too. And you've heard the term bugs. Well, that's because they all had bugs. They had mistakes. They were written by practicing structural engineers who for the most part were engineers. They, like my father, like uh, the guy who wrote Entercalc. You know, these were people who were, most of their day was done designing buildings. And then they did some software, uh, computer programming. And you could buy that computer program from them. When you think you caught a bug, you picked up the phone and you called them and said, hey, when I do this and this, I'm getting a strange answer. And they thank you and fix it and send it back out with the bug fixed. But we didn't trust the computer programs. And I, to this day, don't trust computer programs. That's why I've written my own, for the most part, own spreadsheets, own visual analysis programs. And I am very reluctant, other than uh, a good frame analysis program called Visual Analysis. That's the one I buy and pay for and pay the annual fees. And I spend my software money on AutoCAD and Revit, which get a lot of that. Revit was $14,000. I mean, that's <laughs> uh, still recovering from paying for that. But uh, anyway, that's just the oldest. That's how old I am. That's the old fart standing in front of you saying, and I see young people going out and blindly using programs. And they're, they're written to be complicated. They're written, look over here while they're doing everything over here. Uh, I can't use a program like that. And I know how old that makes me sound. But I, you know, so to really answer your question, I've gotten comfortable with the programs that I use, mainly because I've written them or I have sold them. And, and I've, I've worked them through, and I'm comfortable with them. OK, enough about me. Uh, this project, you know, if you do it nice and neat and you keep track of what you're doing, do this for you, not for me. I'm going to look at it. I'll grade it. I'll be part of the grading. I'll see it. You're going to hold on to this, and hopefully it'll be valuable to you for years to come. So, you know, if you use this at your first job interview, which a lot of people are doing, first of all, the people interviewing you probably can't keep up with what you did. They may just ask you questions. But no one's going to know more. I can almost guarantee that. Um, so you're in a good power position in an interview, which is where you want to be. Um, but remember, you're asking them to pay you money, and you're asking them to pay you a lot of money. You, your work product needs to be, look like it's worth that much money. You're saying, this is what I can do. Hire me and pay me that much money, and I'll do stuff like this. And if you hand over things that look terrible, you're not representing yourself well. It's, you're asking for money, but you're saying, I'm going to give you, you know, some crap work, but I'd like you to pay me a lot of money. But, so if you approach this, make it nice and clean, use straight edges, be descriptive. Uh, you, know, you can use it for interviews. You can use it for people are using it for lunchtime seminars. You will use it to study for your exams, your PE. Probably won't see a pre-stressed concrete question on the PE. Probably will have an option to do it on the structural exam. Um, so anyway, this is for you. And I think it will be useful. And you'll want to be proud of it. And you'll want to work, make it look like uh, you put a lot of good effort into it. Um, OK, I, I do want you to work independently. This, Every mark that you make has to be yours. Every calculation you do needs to be yours. It's OK with me if you're stuck or you're in trouble or you just want to verify things with somebody else, like we do with the homework and just ask them. But please don't work in groups. Please don't copy anybody else's work. Everything has to be independent. Uh, if, if I learn that anybody has done the shear together in a group of three, I'll take the grade they get and divide by three and give everybody one third. Uh, that, unfortunately, has happened. In, in the past. Uh, very rare. Please just don't do it. This is your work for you. Uh, by the way, what, what do you think is going to happen the day after the final? Good. All that stuff. And that'll be the first day that you start forgetting everything that you learned in this class. And that's the <laughs> truth. And it may be years until you're presented with a pre-stressed concrete project at your firm 
or any opportunity or any need to go look at this. It'll be at least five years until you take the structural exam if you do real well and you're blazing ahead. So you want to be able to look back on it and understand what you were doing. So be clear to the future you, not to me. I know what you're doing. It's you in five years who has to pick this thing up and figure out what it was you were doing. And that's why the first few years I allowed spreadsheets and MathCAD and things like that, I've scrapped all that. All that ends up happening is we try to figure out where your computer programming went wrong, and it's a big waste of my time and your time. The worst thing is when you start tabularizing things and you're not clearly writing them out, the chances of you coming back in a few years and understanding what you're doing goes to almost nothing. So as tedious as it seems, hand write out every calculation so that the future you can come back and thoroughly understand what you were doing. Uh, I've had a few questions. Concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. I think I took that for granted, but I shouldn't have. So when I tell you that a 5-inch slab divided by 12, I should say multiplied by 150, that gives you 62.5. That's how I generated all the concrete loads. Okay. We left off with, we'd figure out the distribution factors and set up the moment distribution. I get asked this every once in a while, every, every year. We have combined loads to check stresses in things that we've done. Don't do that here. There's two reasons. Um, one, and the biggest one, is uh, I want you need to be able to check what you're doing with PT data. PT data breaks up a dead load analysis, does a live load analysis, does an equivalent load analysis. Keep those separate. You're going to want those to be separate. We'll combine them as necessary for all the checks, for, for shear, for flexural design, for stress checks. It'll be easy if you break everything up. If you start combining things, it will make your life very difficult. Okay, you're going to want to be at least semi-awake with some coffee or tea or, or at least some way of not being lazy. You are going to have a different dead load in span one than you have in span two. You're going to have a different fixed end moment coefficient in span one and span two. So you got to keep on top of that. You know, in my example, Span 1, fixed end moments, WL squared over 11.63. Span 2 is WL squared over 11.49. Keep those straight. Start off exactly the same. Fixed end moments, right hand rule. Make sure you got the right hand rule right. Remember, dead load's going down, live load's going down, equivalent loads are going to go up. Now be careful, this is different than what we've done. Okay, write those down and then someone tell me how I got these numbers, just in theory. No, just I'm doing moment distribution. Everything's everything's really the same process, but what it, what does this end up having to be? Okay. 
Right now, the joint has 543.7 foot kips. To be in equilibrium, it needs to have what? It can't have any net. It can have a moment, but it can't have any net. So I've got to add negative 543.7 foot kips. You've been doing that all quarter. When you had no column above and you had no column below, that number just went right here as the opposite, and you went to zero. Hey, you have a column above taking moment. You have a column below taking moment. The distribution factor was the stiffness. This was one in everything we were doing before. Um, so we take negative 540. What is that? Okay, we take negative 543. Is there anything that I'm doing that causes that? Okay. So some percentage would go to the upper column. Remember, all the, this is the stiffness of this beam divided by the sum of all the stiffnesses going into that joint. Well, there was a stiffness of the column above. There was a stiffness of the column below. There's a stiffness of the beam. This beam is only going to take 18.9% of all the unbalanced moment. The top column and the bottom column are going to take the rest. So the way I know what goes to this beam is negative 543.7 multiplied by 0.189. That's the part of the unbalanced moment that the beam is going to take. I'm not going to calculate and show you what's going on with the columns, but you could do that. You know what the stiffness above is. You know what the stiffness below. You could create a distribution factor for the top column, a distribution factor for the bottom column. And what would all those distribution factors have to add up to? One. OK. Same thing over here. I've got a column above. I've got a column below. I need to add positive 277.2 to this to get it in equilibrium. And the portion that the beam is going to take is 25.4%. OK, we know where those numbers come from. Same thing as before. If I put a moment on one end of a beam, it affects the other. But not by 0.5 anymore, 0.524. We have a different carryover factor because we have those rigid end zones. So I've added to this beam negative 102.8. That's going to affect the far side by 0.524 times that. Same thing as before. Now I'm at the interior joint. I've put this in equilibrium, and I've put this in equilibrium. I kept the min interior support fixed. I've sent a lot of moment over there. I add these all up. I figure out what the unbalanced moment is. I add the opposite of that. And the way I add the opposite of that is some's gonna go, some of that's going to go to the top column. Some of that's going to go to the bottom column. Some of that is going to go to the right beam. And some of that's going to go to the left beam. I'm not going to show you what's going on to the columns. But it's the part that doesn't get accounted for here. So when I do that, you have to be careful. In everything we've done up till now, you could just go back and add all this stuff up and get to zero and know that your calculations were right. You can't do that anymore because you're not seeing the part that went to the column above and the part that went to the column below. Okay, that's the end of the moment distribution. Why did it converge so fast? Okay, that's the numeric correct answer. What does it mean in, in, in reality? What, what caused that to converge so fast? 
simply the fact that I have columns that are taking a lot of that unbalanced load. So you're going to find when you're doing your moment distributions, they are going to converge very quickly. You're going to go from large numbers to small numbers to little tiny numbers very quickly. It is not difficult to carry significant um, figures. Be as accurate as you can. I'm not asking you to be crazy, but you're trying to match a computer program which has a whole bunch of significant digits. And the way that you're going to know that you're doing everything right is you're, when you get done with a calculation, you're going to be able to check it. And you don't want to be asking yourself, well, is this within calculation round off or not? If you just keep significant figures enough, you're going to be less than 1%, I promise you. Second question, did I make a mistake here? Shouldn't those be the same? No, didn't make a mistake. Why are those not the same? Because the columns. The columns are taking moment above and below. So it is entirely possible, in fact, it will be probable that the beam on one side has a much different moment than the beam on the other side. The difference between those two is what's going to the columns. Okay. Okay, I think by now I've watched enough of you do this. You seem, I don't think you need to see the calculations on what's happening here. Just be careful. You've got two moments now compared to the one that you've usually had. So you've got a counterclockwise moment, a clockwise moment, and a distributed load. Some moments about a point to get this reaction. Some vertical forces if you want to get this reaction. Same thing, nothing new. Be careful about these diagrams because you're going to need everything that you're doing. You're going to need these diagrams when you go to design the shear. So be, you know, make them nice and neat and useful. These values that I'm drawing are at the face of the column. The moments that you're going to use for strength and for allowable stresses are at the face of the column. In concrete design, the columns are too big. We, it would be too conservative to take the center line moment and design for everything. So we've got a two foot wide column. We're going to check. We need to know what the moment is at the face of the column. Okay, I think at this point everybody knows how I found these. Okay, that is the dead load moment diagram. All of the values that you're going to check in PT data for shear and for bending are going to start at the face of the column. It actually doesn't print the center line moment or shear value. That's for designers, that's the center line is really um, irrelevant. So, 
you've done a moment distribution and you've calculated the center line values. What you have to do now is calculate the moment values at the face of the column. And you do that by subtracting the area under the shear diagram between the center line of the column and the face of the column. So from your shear diagram, the, the center line shear is 49.4. The face of the column shear is 47.8. The area under that shape is the change in moment from the center line to the face. So 459.2 foot kips minus, this is one foot. That's why I gave you a two foot column. The center line to the face is one foot. One foot times 49.4 plus 47.8 divided by two. Subtract that moment. The moment at the face is 410.6. That's the moment you're going to use to check against the computer program. And basically all concrete computer programs are done this way. Everything is done at the face of the column. Okay, I want you all to write this down, make it real clear, and I want you to be able to refer to these numbers, this 410.6. By the way, I've put this delta M value here. The change in moment from here to here over that 30.06 feet, one half times that total area, 49.4 times 30.06, that's the change in moment from the negative center line moment to where the shear crosses zero. So that's how we're finding the maximum positive moment. Be careful. You're not starting at zero anymore. Like all the homework assignments you've done up till now, the, you calculated the area under the shear diagram, and that was the positive moment. That's not the case anymore. That's the change in moment from where you start. So the area under here is 742.4. Subtract that from the 459.2 and get the positive moment. So, is everybody clear on that? You've got negative moments everywhere. You're not going to have a zero moment at a support. Okay, so if you can, neatly put a box around... Those face of column moments and that positive moment. Does everybody have that in their notes? Because the screen's going to block that. Well, actually, it might not. Because you're going to do the dead load, the next thing we're going to do is the live load, then we're going to do the equivalent loads. The stresses will be checked based on what combination. You guys, you guys know this now. Go back to your homeworks. You check stresses on unfactored, service level, dead plus live plus equivalent loads. So you'll combine those three load cases to check stresses. Now you're going to design um, flexure. What do you need? You need 1.2 times the dead load, 1.6 times the live load, and then you need what else? What haven't we calculated yet? We're going to have to figure out how to extract the secondary moments out of that equivalent load moment diagram. But you're going to start everything with the dead load, the live load, and the equivalent loads. From the equivalent loads, we'll get out the secondary moment diagram, just like you're doing or you just did in your homework. From that, you have everything you need. Now it's just mixing and matching as necessary, depending on what you're designing. The stress checks will be dead load, live load, equivalent loads. Flexure, 1.2 dead, 1.2 live, 1.0 secondary. Shear, 1.2 dead shears, 1.6 live. So it's better if you just keep dead loads, live loads, and equivalent loads separated, then factor them as necessary, depending on what you're checking, and add them together. Okay, I have pulled up my example. I go to the review menu. I go to unfactored beam moments. And this is span one. 
Span one dead load right there, 410.63. I got 410.6. You will be that close. Everybody thinks I cheated when I look do this. Okay, the other end is 505.2. I got 505.1. I'm happy with that. Positive moment. The maximum positive moment that I see in here is 282.48. I calculated 283.2. The positive moments might be off a little bit because what, what PT data is doing is breaking it up into it's discretizing the span and just calculating it at a series of points. It's not necessarily finding where the shear diagram cross zero. You can add more points and get closer to it. Um, I think in, in uh, well, anyway, the face of column is the face of column. So your negative moments are going to be extremely close because you're checking at exactly the same point. You may be off by a few inches or even a couple of feet in the positive moment regions. But remember what the positive moment diagram looks like. It flattens out and it becomes very flat. So if you're checking numbers here and PT data is checking numbers there, you are probably within an extremely close uh, actual value because the moment diagram has flattened so much. So you're still going to find, even though PT data is showing you a location and your location is off from that slightly, you know, dead load's going to be at one point. Live load's going to be close, but not at exactly that same point. The equivalent load's going to be off, maybe not at either of those two points. But they're all going to be hovering with a maximum right in this zone where all of those diagrams go very flat. So you're going to find remarkable accuracy, even though you're not at exactly the same point for necessarily any of those values. But So pretty good. I've got dead load at the face. Maximum positive moment, go to the next span. PT data got 33.18. I got 33.0. Positive moment, the maximum positive moment I see in here is 125.88. I calculated 126.5. Face of column at the other end, 150.9. I got 151.0. You can expect this similar accuracy as you start going through. Just don't round too much. You know, just keep a couple decimal points going. Remember how quickly your, your moment distribution converges. You, you, it's not going to hurt you with time to keep some extra digits just through the moment diagrams. They're going to converge in about four iterations because the columns are there. So. It's not going to take up a whole bunch of paper to be accurate. Once you get the moment diagrams figured out, you can lighten up a little bit on the accuracy worries. But start with accurate shears and moments. Those are the basis for everything we're going to do. And it's not that hard to stay accurate just to get those. Now, I have printed these sheets, and I've given you that in the hard copy. So you have a hard copy of this. If you're using the program, you should be able to pull up the review menu and see the exact same things. Okay, the next case is the live load. I've made life very easy on myself. Okay, this is very important. Nobody wake up Kevin, but everybody else. Oh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> I want everybody to get this. You cannot do what I've just done here. My live load distribution, I had the same live load and the same dead load in both spans. So I can just ratio my um, dead load shear and moment diagrams by a factor to get my live load shear and moment diagrams. You don't have that same luxury. I've given you a completely different dead load distribution than live load. You, ha <laughs> you have to, you can go back to sleep now. I just want to get you at that point. OK, all right, he's up. <laughs> That's good. You are going to do a full moment distribution on your live load, a full moment distribution on your dead load, a full moment distribution on your equivalent loads. I am not.
Every year I will get a couple of people that try to ratio, because I did it, they'll try to do it. Please don't. Okay, because I can just ratio mine. This is my live load and my dead load. I could show you on PT data how accurate it is, but since I just ratioed them, I hopefully you'll believe me without showing it to you. But, but take this down because we're going to use it throughout the project. Okay, equivalent loads. Yeah. This one. You. Are you still copying that? Okay. Okay, no, I didn't get the signs wrong. The equivalent loads are going up. I'm going to draw the moment diagram correctly. Okay, the balance load is the equivalent load. So, PT data at the face of column gets 279.9. I get 280.0. The program and the span gets 282.48. That seems wrong. Because I'm looking at the dead load. 192.58, that's better. I got 193.1. 344.66, looking pretty good. Two 
103.7. Pretty good. Any questions? You're capable now. We're not done. I got more to do. But de dead load, live load, equivalent load. Your equivalent loads will be based off of that profile that I showed you in the beginning. Um, I'm going to even draw it on the board right now so we don't make any mistakes. All 58 are doing this problem. 12 tendons, 4 inches from the bottom here, 15 inches from the bottom here. If I change this to 14 or change this to 16, it probably works just fine. There's no one right answer in design. That's one thing I want you to know. There's it's a matter of opinions, especially in post-tension concrete design. I could modify these things a little bit and get something that still works. So there's nothing wrong if you were to calculate that you thought this should be 14 or 16, but we're using 15. <laughs> Everybody's doing the same thing. We're not going to grade more than one set of solutions. Is everybody clear on that? As clear as I thought I made it last year and did all this same stuff, I had one person that did their own design, and, and it was just a nightmare. Yes? So in PT, that, this is the same as the project one in PT? Yes. Where you put 21 inches down from the top? Whatever I put down from the top, yeah. This was, I think, 11.65 from the top. PT data measures everything from the top. So this is four inches from the top. And then it draws it from the bottom because that's the way your drawings and your draftsman will depict it because that's the way it gets chaired. So when I wrote the graphic for it, my dad wrote the, all the guts of the program, but I did write the graphic part. And we had a lot of requests that all the dimensions be from the bottom because that's where, how it gets specified on drawing. So. Okay, so everybody's doing that. Because if you don't do that, your dead load, moment diagram, and shear diagram will be correct. Your live load, shear and moment diagram will be correct. And your equivalent load moment diagram will not be. I mean, it won't be wrong because it might all still work, but it's not what I'm asking you to do. Okay, so all of this up until now, unless we had the program, we don't know if this works. This has been a good, educated guess and a solid guess based upon engineering judgment. Now it's time to figure out if our guess worked or not.
Make sure you keep the signs correct. This, this can get a little confusing. Okay, I am going to do a few sample calculations to show you how to calculate the stresses. You are going to do all of the calculations, top and bottom, at every location. The left column face, the interior span, the right column face, the left column face and span two, interior span, right column face, stress top, stress bottom. Every one of them gets checked against the program or the output. I'll do a couple calcs to get you going. Okay, the stress at the top at the left column face, you expect you should be in tension. You might not be, but you expect to be. The moment due to dead loads, live loads, and equivalent loads is 310.3 foot kips, negative. Divide by the section modulus to the top, subtract F over A, that's the tension force at the top of the beam, left column face, span one. Okay, I did some couple of the sample calculations to show you how I got this 088 right here and negative 1.084 and then I went over to the span and I got the 269 in tension and the negative 539 compression here and then I filled in all the rest. Okay, span one, left column face. Point zero eight eight, point zero eight eight. That's on the top. On the bottom, negative one point oh eight four, negative one point oh eight four. In the span, top negative 539, I got negative 539. Bottom 268, I got 269. You will be this accurate too. I, and if something's not, literally, if you're, if you're off by more than 1%, ask yourself if you've got anything wrong in there because chances are you might. 173, I got 174. 1.268, I got the same thing. Go to the next span, 0 0.107, or 0 0.017, 0 0.017. That's top, bottom, 931, I got 930 in compression. Three ninety six, I got three ninety seven. Negative point oh three nine, I got negative point oh three eight. 
148. Notice in span two in my example, both the top and the bottom are in compression. So I remember, negative is compression in PT data, and in your calcs, negative 0.576. So you're going to go along. You're going to have calculations similar to this. One thing I'll just show you how the program works. Those were all the stresses, and those are fun to go look at. The ones that mattered, I kept over on the right. I actually added this to my dad's program. Where you're really looking for tension, the program's going to go look there. It may not be tension, but it's going to look where you'd expect tension. It's got the 088, 269, 173, next span, 0 0.017. 0.039, it's actually in compression, and negative 0.145. So with the program and you're at your office, when you're playing with profiles and you're, you're moving this around to, it's immediately changing those stresses that you care about. So as you're playing with it, you're seeing the tensile stresses actually change over on the right, which is what this is. In your design practice, those would be the ones that you're calculating and you really care about. I apologize up front. I want you to calculate top stress, bottom stress, every joint, left and right side at the interior joint, and in the span. That'll be the last time you ever do this, I promise, but at least you'll have done it once. Then after that, you'll realize the only ones that mattered were those in the tension region. You're nowhere near allowable compression, but you've got to prove that to yourself on one example. You won't just believe me. Okay.